Well, we always tell the students uh, it's great to have a, quantitative, a qualitative understanding of all the principles we talk about, but when you, when you add a, a quantitative understanding to it, you, you gain a whole new appreciation and you, you have an enhanced feeling. And, and something I like to ask is, where's all the carbon on the planet? Um, and, you know, we certainly know a lot about the atmosphere. We talk about 385 ppm and 2 degrees warming. But where, where do you think most of the carbon is? Is it in the atmosphere? Well, there, there, are, there are a few hundred billion tons of CO2 in Earth's atmosphere, about 400 billion tons. A billion tons is a gigaton. So a billion, there are, there are a thousand millions in a billion. A billion's 10 to the ninth, a million's 10 to the sixth. Uh, well, what about the hydrosphere? I mean, we, we know, we believe the oceans can take in total maybe about 1,500 billion tons of carbon dioxide. And the Chinese are telling North America and Europe, you or your parents have already put 1,000 billion tons out there. So now it's our turn, and we're going to put our 500 billion tons. So you guys go carbon neutral, but we're going to build a coal-fired power plant every five days. Uh, what about, what about the, the, the biosphere? I mean, trees, all the plankton in the oceans. Um, there, there's a few thousand billion tons uh, in, in Earth's biosphere. Actually, it turns out most of the carbon on the planet is in Earth's lithosphere. The, the crust of the Earth is about 10% limestone, carbonate rocks. And... Uh, that's calcium carbonate, and uh, the molecular weight of calcium carbonate is about 100. The molecular weight of CO2 is about 44. Um, so way over 98% of the carbon on Earth is in the lithosphere of the Earth in the form of limestone. There are, there are at least 70 million billion tons of CO2 in the lithosphere of the Earth. These are the White Cliffs of Dover, and you're looking at a few billion tons of CO2 that was captured 100 million years ago in the Cretaceous and is permanently sequestered in the form of uh, calcium carbonate. Now, when you look at the issue we face today, um, in the humans are putting about 28 billion tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today. Now remember we said we think the, the world can take about 1,500 billion tons and, the, and then the permafrost in Siberia is going to melt and nothing's going to come up and it's, it's game over, right? So, so and we've already put 1,000 billion tons in there. And we're putting 28 billion tons a year out there and about half of it comes from transportation. It's coming from the uh, tailpipes of cars, planes, trains, uh, airplanes. Uh, but about half of it comes from what we call concentrated point sources, meaning uh, coal-fired power plants mainly are putting out almost 10 billion of those 28 billion tons. And cement plants and other industrial plants are putting out about six, 6 billion tons a year. And that number is growing. It's not leveling and it's not going down, it's growing. Not only is China putting in a 1,000 megawatt coal plant every five days, the Indians are doing one about every two weeks. They just built a 3.2 gigawatt unscrubbed coal-fired power plant in Mumbai, and that's just the start of it. Half the population in India is under the age of 14. Um, so we, we wish it wasn't this way, but the way it is, coal will be the major uh, raw material used for electrical power generation for the, our entire lifetimes. And uh, 
we're going to try as hard as we can to put as much renewable online as we can, but we also have to be realistic about the fact that by 2030, we might, if we were up to 8.6% renewable, that would be wonderful if we could get there. But even at that, 48% of all our electrical power generation is going to come from the burning of coal. And one thing about the combustion of coal is it's a great way to make CO2. <laughs> uh, in fact, it's the best way. For every ton of coal you, you combust, you make two and a half tons of carbon dioxide. Um, the approaches that are being looked at, this is for California, but there's a similar model for the world, is California is going to try and get from 500 million tons of CO2 the state's putting out today, instead of following business as usual and going up to 1,000, essentially 1 billion tons a year from California, we're going to attempt to get down to 100 million tons of CO2 a year by implementing a lot of the, you know, smart growth, decarbonization, biofuels, these sorts of things. Um, the cement plants have all left the state of California because of this law, because when you want to make Portland cement, which is a cementing phase of concrete, uh, you produce about a ton of CO2 for every ton of Portland cement you make. And the way you make cement is you mine limestone, actually, and you heat it up. Uh, and uh, oxidize it, produce CO2, and you make Portland cement. Um, the other interesting thing about China is China is pouring uh, the majority of the concrete in the world today, uh, building coal electrical power plants and pouring concrete at an enormous rate. Well, if you, if you kind of look at it, when you combust coal, what comes out this stack is about 10 to 15 percent carbon dioxide. Natural gas combustion from a natural gas plant is for 5 percent carbon dioxide. Cement plants about 20 to 40 percent carbon dioxide in refineries. But if you look at the blue, uh, the quantity, most of the CO2. It's coming from coal-fired power plants in the U.S., uh, less from natural gas. But the cost of actually extracting the CO2 gets much higher as it becomes more dilute. So if we were to ever try and capture all that CO2 from the coal plants and put it in a pure stream of CO2, which governments have spent almost trillions of dollars on, but hundreds of billions of dollars in the last decade trying to do so that they could then inject it into the ground. It would cost upwards of $50 a ton. And if we were really going to do that, we'd have to separate about 10 billion tons a year and inject it into the ground. So 10 billion times $50 starts adding up. And there's no way it's economically sustainable, even if it were technologically possible. So the one approach that if you went to the Copenhagen Treaty, any of these treaties that they talked about, which is injected into the ground, is completely infeasible. It's never going to happen. The only reservoir on the planet that's sustainable is the built environment. We use about 30 to 40 billion tons of building materials every year. We mine 32 billion tons of rock alone that goes into road base, asphalt, and concrete. Concrete is the most traded material other than water in the world. It's the most common building material. It's more than 50% of all building materials. The whole economy stops if, the con if there's a shortage of cement or concrete. We're completely dependent on concrete in our society. Well, you can take 16 billion tons of carbon dioxide and turn it into about 32 billion tons of building materials. So it's a reservoir where we can do this sustainably for years to come. It's actually not new. During World War II, um, when they needed an airway on any of the... Uh, atolls in the South Pacific, and I landed on all of these during my dissertation work in 
the Tuamotus and other places, they would take the skeletal remains of marine organisms, which are those white sands out on the beach, they would put them up on the low islands and make limestone the same way limestone is naturally made. They'd irrigate it with fresh water, and these are unstable carbonate minerals, like the skeletons of corals and clams and shells, that white sand that you know about. When you, when you hit it with fresh water, it solidifies. And those runways are still there today, and they're in great shape. In fact, going back further, both the New World and Old World pyramids are all limestone. And it's not just blocks of limestone and those stories about slaves moving the limestones around. At Stanford, we've been studying the ancient concretes and mortars in those pyramids. The way they got those blocks to the top is they didn't haul them up to the top. Those are concrete blocks that were poured in place with ancient carbonate limestones, which are uh, holding up pretty well. <laughs> Durability is important in concrete. Uh, without going a lot into the technology, uh, we've been able to take the uh, unstable carbonate minerals and turn them into a replacement for Portland cement. So instead of creating a ton of CO2, we capture half a ton of CO2 and turn it into a ton of cement. So you don't need that ton of Portland cement anymore. And we can turn it into aggregate and make a concrete that has a, a net difference of 1,600 pounds less than uh, an, an average uh, yard of concrete. In addition, if you burn a ton of coal, you get two and a half tons of CO2, which is enough to make five tons of cement or five tons of aggregate. That avoids mining five tons of limestone and open pit mining, or seven and a half tons in this case, to make cement. Now, what's interesting is in the history of the planet, this is over the last 500 million years, so this is today. This is 100 million years ago, 200, 300, 400, 500. Carbon dioxide levels have been much higher on Earth than they are today. And in fact, when carbon dioxide levels were the highest, that's when the most limestone formed. So what Earth's done in the past is the opposite of what we think is happening. Uh, the more carbon dioxide there is, actually, well, we know plant life flourishes, but it turns out marine life, like reef-building organisms, flourish too, and they make a lot of calcium carbonate out of the CO2. For example, during the Cretaceous, this is a modern tridacnid clam, and it has plants in its tissue. And every, for every mole of carbon dioxide they form, they release a mole of CO2 for their, their plant, their symbionts, to eat. And during the Cretaceous, there are massive limestone deposits that were formed when CO2 was seven times higher in the atmosphere. There were no polar ice caps, and it was a lot warmer. But there was also massive reefs forming. In fact, during that time, this group, the coccoliths, uh, the same species which arose in the Cretaceous 100 million years ago, if we take it today, because it's still alive, and we put it in uh, seawater with increased levels of CO2, it actually grows better, and it makes more calcium carbonate. Because it, when it evolved, the Earth had seven times as much CO2 in that atmosphere. In fact, they have uh, responded as the CO2 has gone up to actually produce more. So we've created a process where you put alkaline water together with the raw flue gas from power plants and run it through an absorber to make these materials. I took down this 200-acre facility next to the largest power plant on the West Coast, which sprays seawater through the raw flue gas, 2008. It's, it was up to a continuous 10 megawatt demonstration plant level by 2010. They're building uh, roads and overpasses in Santa Cruz, California with that cement right now. It's carbon negative. Uh, this is a plant that's going in in Inner Mongolia now. So it's going to take in flue gas and uh, alkaline water. It's going to, in this case, take 
So it's gonna, this one's going to take about 70,000 tons of CO2 and capture about 57,000 tons of it. Um, so the uh, point is, it's possible to do this. The, the, the business, the profit margins in building materials are very slim. And it, it's only going to happen with a lot of government involvement. But it can happen with public-private partnerships where you get low-rate financing to build these big structures. It's, a, it's about $1,000 per kilowatt equivalent, which means that's about a billion dollars for a typical coal plant. But it costs about $3 billion to build the coal plant anyway. And by actually making building materials out of it, it's very profitable. Concrete industry is the largest industry in the world. But it's, it's only going to happen uh, with uh, significant government involvement. And it turns out most of the building materials we use are actually used in roads, not in buildings. So the built environment is really about building roads. And when you go to the fuel station and you pump gas, there's an 18.6 cent tax on every gallon of gas that goes to the Department of Transportation. That adds up to billions of dollars. And there's a lot of money there to do this, to build roads out of carbon negative material and clean up the environment at the same time. So we, I believe this is probably the most probable and doable solution because it's economically sustainable as well as uh, technologically sustainable for centuries to come. Thanks. <laughs>